Interior design and plant parenthood have way more in common than you might think. They're frankly two sugar snap peas in a pod. If you think about it, as gardeners and houseplant parents, we all have homes. We all want our houseplants and gardens to look beautiful and elicit joyful, calming vibes, and we want the same from our interiors. I recently connected with today's guest, Kelly, who is a fellow podcaster and a professional interior designer and avid gardener. Our conversation ebbed and flowed between design and plants, and I thought, dang, this could be a really interesting conversation for an episode, exploring how we can apply interior design principles to our plant collections. Kelly is the perfect intersection of both worlds to do just that, and today is basically a two-for-one episode. You're going to get interior design tips and garden design tips, so let's get growing. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Podcast. Welcome back. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. And welcome. Welcome home if you are a new listener. I'm Maria, the host of the Growing Joy podcast, and it's my sheer delight to help you be happier through plants. When we talk about growing joy through plants, I realize, you know, you can't really discuss growing joy with plants without discussing your home. Because whether you're a plant parent with seven house plants, a plant parent with a hundred house plants, or an avid gardener with the rose garden of my dreams, the place where you live dramatically influences what your collection looks like and the level of joy that you can experience while engaging with them. Yes, we love plants and gardens that grow wild and give off that more natural kind of wild flower aesthetic, but there's a method to the madness. Yes, we love homes that look lived in and comfortable, but there's a method to that madness as well. And today's guest, Kelly, the co-host of the Decorating Tips and Tricks podcast, a gorgeous interior designer, has a lifetime of experience in making both homes and gardens feel inviting because she has a garden that is truly to die for. So today... We're exploring how those intersect, but you're going to get tips for your interior and tips from your garden. I've actually applied a couple of these tips, like anchoring black throughout your house and creating little motifs. I'm recording this after the episode. I'm forgetting the word that she used, but like the little pairings of three of like cute little things around your house. I've done both of those things since I've had this conversation. So anyway... I hope you enjoy. Before we dive in, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to some listeners who are new members of our Growing Joy Garden Society. If you don't know what that is, it's our digital platform and app, Algorithm and Troll Free, where our international group of listeners can come together to make new plant friends, propagate their knowledge, and grow more joy in their lives. This little app is so fun. It's got a plant swap section. It's got discussion topics on houseplants, plantrepreneurship. There's a special plantrepreneur group, gardening, planty DIY. We have monthly calls. They're called Planty Show and Tells, where our international community hops on a call together and talks about what's growing in their houseplant collection or garden. It's really just the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. And by supporting that platform, you also support me and this business in creating monthly content for you. So thank you to our newest members, Stephen T., Monica W., Amanda L., and Mandy C. I am so thankful. I'm so excited to get to know you better in the platform. And if you're listening and might want to check the platform out for yourself, all you have to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan, enter your info, and boom, you'll be right in there and we'll give you tons of information on how to get growing in the platform immediately. Speaking of making new plant friends, I'm so excited to introduce you to my new plant friend, Kelly, who's going to hit us up with nine interior design tips that we can apply to our gardens. So let's get growing. (music) Kelly, welcome to Growing Joy. Thank you so much for having me, Maria. This is thrilling. I don't get to talk about plants and gardening as much as I'd like on my podcast, so I'm going to go to town today with you. You know, we connected and I'm so excited to have this conversation because you're an interior designer, but garden design and interior design has so many similarities. And I'm so excited to like pick your brain and noodle around on, you know, the Venn diagram of interior design and garden design. Before we dive into this, I'd love to know a little bit more about you, what your garden looks like and what your kind of planty journey has looked like alongside your interior design journey. 
Well, I've always loved gardening. There was something about it uh, when I was growing up. I grew up in a very suburban neighborhood, but there was a lady behind us and I could see her yard. And I don't know, she was seemed very European to me. I don't know. She was very old and she had a big garden where everybody else just had lawn and you know some shrubs and maybe a tree. And she was always out there. And I was very shy when I was little. So I, I never went up to her or introduced myself or got in there, but I was fascinated by her garden. And in fact, I even started my own little plot in our backyard. And this was before raised beds were a thing. And I had a little area where I had my tomatoes and I was growing this and that. And I would try different things. And then every house or apartment, because I lived in Manhattan for a long time, as you did, I would have plants. And on the weekends, I'd be out. We had a house out in Southampton. I'd be in my garden there. I'd go out on Friday nights with like a headlamp (laughs) to see what was going on, to see what (laughs) the deer had eaten or not eaten. And at that time I was an attorney. So I was spending a lot of my days, you know, in a suit, in an office, in a courtroom most of the time. So I wasn't getting that connection that I really craved with the outside. Then I moved to California where I could garden 12 months a year, which is fantastic. And I reinvented myself into what my passion had always been, which is interior design and garden design. And from there was my blog and then my book and then the podcast and my clients who are many local, but also many virtual. And I do a lot of virtual interior design as well as garden design. And I love doing the garden design because I get to share all the things that I've learned and try different things out in other people's gardens. Right now, um, my garden is like Sissinghurst. It is an all-white garden, which I love Really? Yeah. I love the control of it, you know, working within the limitations of that monochromatic look and also integrating a lot of variegated plants to really bring it to life. But I decided that that was the right look for this house. So I love doing other people's gardens where I'm doing lots of color. That is so cool. So what gave you the inspiration to do an all-white garden? Our current home is Victorian from 1886. So it's pretty fanciful. And I just felt like I wanted to give it a a fresher, cleaner line. So it's all white with black. You know, when we bought the, it had a, it needed a lot of work, let's just say. Mm. It took me a little while to get to the garden, but the garden really was non-existent. But we had to do the inside first. And everyone said, oh, it's a Victorian. And, you know, how many colors are you going to paint it? And I was like, no, I just wanted white and black and simple. And I just wanted to give it this unifying factor with the color of the house into the garden. And because there's a lot of gingerbread and it is a little froofy as the Victorian exteriors can be. So I thought that would just really give it a little more streamlined, simple feel to it. And I love it. That's amazing. So I have had your friend Betsy Helmuth on the show for a very successful episode over a year ago where we broke down, I'm design illiterate when it comes to interior design. Yeah, but you said that about plants too, and that was just a few years ago. So I think you can take on interior design as well. Fair, totally fair. (laughs) And the episode with Betsy was so eye-opening because she kind of profiled these different design aesthetics like bohemian, glam, like all these type of things, which I had never really understood or known about. Plants definitely gear more bohemian, I think, than anything else. What would you say your interior design style is? In a word, timeless. I really, and we talk about this all the time on my podcast, which is Decorating Tips and Tricks. We want for ourselves, I have a co-host, so we, and we want ourselves and our listeners to create a timeless look. You really don't want to be, you know, stuck in a specific trend or even a specific movement or or certainly not a moment, not a blip on the screen. So I like to incorporate lots and lots of antiques. I love antiques and I love mixing them in with some modern pieces because I think the juxtaposition is where the magic happens inside and out. And we'll talk about that with respect to the garden in a bit, but that's where it's happening. You don't want, I didn't want, it's particularly having a Victorian home, it to look like a museum and look like it was trapped in 1886. We needed to respect the past, but move it forward into the 21st century, you know, for a family to live here with kids and dogs and all of that. I wanted it to feel like 
us. And so I have some very modern pieces sitting next to some very old traditional brown type furniture and lots of patina mixed with shiny stuff. That's what I love. So it's more of a collected look. And when I say timeless, it's as if you really couldn't say, oh, they did that in you know 2018 when modern farmhouse was all the rage. Yeah. So I, and we always encourage amazing. our listeners to make it not only their own, but incorporate a lot of different styles because they will work together and make each other better by positioning them close to each other. How do you feel about taking an antique and then actually modernizing the antique? Like a lot of people I follow on TikTok find these antiques and then paint them teal or swap yeah. out the doorknobs. Like, do you like that? Or are you like keeping the antique piece in its originality and then having it next to a modern piece in its originality? The painted furniture thing was really hot for a long time, particularly when I first started my blog, which was My Soulful Home launched in 2013. So I would say somewhere between 2013 and maybe into 2018, 19, just before the real modern farmhouse thing came on hard, people were painting everything. You know, Shabby Chic was very popular then. So I think that that's a certain look. And it can really pop in certain decors, but I wouldn't paint all the furniture. I would do that very judiciously. And if you could choose something that has great bones, it can look really great to do it in a lacquer or something like that, to really, so, you know, putting a shiny coat of paint on something that has very traditional lines can be pretty spectacular. Yeah. Don't do all your furniture like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. Totally fair. You know, it's interesting. So you've been gardening. So when did you start your first plot? Eight or nine, when I first put in my first tomato plants in the backyard. That's amazing. Start them young. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. <laughs> So with interior design, where did you learn your expertise? Like, how did you become an interior designer from being a lawyer? Well, I think I just always had a good eye. People always said, oh, you have a really good eye. You know, so I think that there's some innate ability to see something. Anita is my co-host on the podcast, and we always choose that our superpower is being able to see a room and know what's wrong with it or what to do with it or how to make it better. There's just something about spatial relation and whatnot that I just, I was always good at, but I've honed it. I, even when I was an attorney, I mean, obviously I was very busy doing that, but this was my passion. So I read everything I could read. I went to designer showcase houses. I would you know, if there was a sign for a house for sale, I'm in there and I'm seeing what did they do? How would I do it better? You know, I go for a run through the neighborhood and I think, oh, I'd take that fence down or maybe take out those azaleas and put something else in. You know, I'm always thinking about how to improve the home or the landscape of things that I'm seeing. So it was really just a natural progression of my interests. And like you, I started out it was something that I loved and I felt like I knew a lot about. I did not go to school for interior design, but so many interior designers have not. And I just learned more and more as I went and gained more and more confidence. And when we moved to California, I really wasn't too thrilled about coming here from New York. I thought I'd be going right back. So I did a house over and people were like, whoa, that looks great. You know, could you come help me do this? And I was trying to make friends. So I was helping people move furniture around and all this. And I realized when it was then a friend of a friend of a friend that I really had a business here. And because my kids were little at that time, I decided to channel it into a blog and go that route. But I've just, I'm a lifelong learner. You know, that's how I feel about the garden too. And that's one of the reasons I love gardening so much is because you can never know it all. All right, plant friends, it's time to bring the beauty of outdoors inside your home with Soltech's full-spectrum plant lights. Soltech is a long-term sponsor of the podcast, and I have used and loved their grow lights for years at this point. If you're looking for a stylish way to provide all the necessary photosynthetic rays to grow and maintain your plants indoors, Soltech has you covered. Their lights are perfect for upgrading your plant's environment and adding a touch of spring to any room, from succulents to ferns. Their warm white light is ideal for growing houseplants, and they offer a range of solutions, including grow bulbs, track lights, and the most popular American-built aspect pendant light. 
When I tell you these lights are so gorgeous in your home and cannot be identified as grow lights, I am not lying. They look like normal bulbs, normal white light, museum quality lighting, actually. I had three of the Aspect pendant lights in my home, and I'm not joking, anytime we entertained, no one knew what they were, but I would always blow up my own spot and be like, did you know those are grow lights? <laughs> and in this current house we're in, I've been using the Vita Grow Bulb a lot. I just screw it into a desk lamp or a floor lamp, and boom, I have a highlight haven for my plants in my dark office. But don't just take my word for it, plant friends. They have thousands of five-star reviews. Soltex products speak for themselves. And they back everything with a 90-day money-back guarantee so you can purchase with confidence. So if you're curious, buy it and see if you like it. They're offering 15% off for our listeners with the code BLOOM15. That's BLOOM15 at Soltech.com today. Once again, that's Soltech.com with code BLOOM15 for 15% off your purchase at checkout. Beautiful plants deserve beautiful lighting. Upgrade your plant game with Soltech and use code BLOOM15, BLOOM15 for 15% off at checkout at Soltech.com. Mother's Day is around the corner, plant friends, and Wind River Chimes is going to make your life a freaking breeze by delivering the most magical, most thoughtful, oh yeah, and personalized gift straight to your door. Wind River creates premium, handcrafted, and hand-tuned wind chimes, which are designed for exceptional precision and lasting beauty. For over 35 years, Wind River has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, restful environment. You heard the wind chime in the intro to this ad. Don't you think it would make the most fantastic gift? Mama Fiella is redoing her lanai in Florida, and she has already put in a request for the wind chimes when the lanai is done, so she'll definitely be getting one for Mother's Day. A wind chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chimes singing in the wind, they're going to think of you, and they're going to be gifted a moment of calm, and they'll associate that moment of calm with you, plant friend. See where I'm going here? It's the gift that keeps on giving. So with Mother's Day coming up and Memorial Day coming up, it would be such a magical gift. Plus, Wind River is offering a free engraving on all of their Corinthian bells. So head to windriverchimes.com to listen to all of the different melodious options and use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com for a free engraving on their Corinthian bells to add a special personalized element to your gift. They come in a variety of color, sizes, and sounds, so head to their website to explore Wind River riverchimes.com with code GROWINGJOY at checkout for a free engraving on all Corinthian bells. I'm so excited to jam on this interior garden design parallels. As you're saying, they exist. So you and I huddled. I binged some of your YouTube videos. We came up with nine of your top interior design tips that you give your interior designers, you know, your audience. I want those tips for my audience. We all have homes. We could all use some tips. But then I'm so curious to kind of play on these tips and see how we can apply them to our our garden aesthetics. So where shall we begin? What is tip number one? Well, as a caveat to all of that, you're absolutely right. And I think that the interior is interwoven with the exterior. So I think about, you know, whether... If you're in an apartment, of course, you really can't probably change the facade of your apartment building, but maybe you have a little balcony or a little patio. But if you have a home, whether you're a renter or you're owning the home, take the architecture into consideration. Think about what the existing landscape is, and that should inform some of your decisions for your interiors and vice versa. So I think that they are very interwoven. They shouldn't be thought about as separate things, like this is the outside, this is the inside. So it's it's nice for the flow of the entire property if it all makes sense together. And it's very soothing to the eye, just like one of my specific tips that we'll get to in a little bit. It's calming if you have this flow. So you could have an overall flow from the inside to the outside. So yes, interiors, exteriors, interwoven in my mind. The best tip that I can share, and everybody can do it so easily, is to take a photo. So whether you're talking about a room or outside, and you say, why do I have to take a photo? I see this every day. I know I don't like this, or I know I do like this, or I know the sun comes in this way. 
It is amazing when you take a photo of your space, whether it's your living room, your entry, your dining room, wherever, or your backyard, your front yard, or your patio, or your balcony, you will see things that you do not see when you look at it with your naked eye because the eye fills in. So your eye will sort of fill in the spaces and also you kind of get blind to what you're seeing every day a little bit. But you see it in a photo, you're going to be able to say right away, oh, I can see the problem here. Or I know I don't like this. Let me look harder and see why I don't like this. So trust me. And so easy. Grab your phone, take a photo. You're going to see things in that photo that will really help you either decorate the interior or your garden. I love this tip especially because I think plant parents can be really prone to this. What I realized that taking a photo helps me is seeing the clutter. Like yes. I feel like I get really blind to clutter. And then when I take a photo of something, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much stuff on the you know the table. Or especially with plant parents, when we have large plant collections, 50, 100 houseplants, it can get really congested. And when you see a photo and it helps you zoom out for the bigger picture, I think that's super helpful. So take a photo. Simple, free, easy tip that is going to immediately kind of give you the perspective that you need. And other tangential benefits of doing that in your home, you've got a great photo journal and everybody loves the before and after. So if you are going to make some changes, then you've got the before picture and then you can enjoy looking at the after and it's great content for your Instagram. And for the outside, the same way. I have all sorts of garden journals that I've kept, lists of plants that I have tried that have been successful or not successful. Well, add your photos into that too. And you'll be amazed. Or you you think, oh, those aren't really growing. Well, maybe look at the photo you took two years ago and see how big those shrubs have now gotten, you know, and things like that. So it's helpful in a lot of different ways, but definitely to get a, a very clear assessment of what that room looks like, take the photo. My next tip for outside or inside is limit your color palette. Now, if you are a professional designer or a professional landscape designer, sure, you can throw in a larger number of colors or types of plants or whatnot. But if you are sort of, you know, the weekend gardener or you enjoy your interior decorating, but, you know, that's not your profession, or you feel like you don't have a ton of confidence in it yet, limit your color palette. It's going to work for the pros and it's going to work for the Sunday afternoon gardener or the Saturday afternoon interior designer because it's going to limit the universe. It's going to enable you to create this flow through an individual room and also throughout your whole home. Now, if you've got kids and they want pink and blue rooms or purple and green rooms, that's a different story. But if you're talking about the public rooms, pick a limited color palette. Three colors is great. This is just blowing my mind. So three colors, like talk me through how I select a color palette. We could talk for ages about the color wheel and complementary colors. I've got a ton of podcast episodes on things like that or how to find your signature palette. We've covered it all. I mean, we have 565 episodes. So if you want to know anything about decorating, you can find it. But simply, you can look for things that are like... I'm very I'm obviously pretty monochromatic if I have an all white garden, but it's not all just pure white. You know, there's a the little variation. So you could do a monochromatic variation, but it's nice, particularly in the interiors, to put some color in there. And color is coming on much stronger in interior design now than it had been in the last several years. There was a lot of gray and mono, uh, monochromatic rooms, lots of whites. So color is fun to work with. So you could pick colors that are opposite on the wheel. So a purple and a yellow. Purple and a yellow and a white is really my favorite combination in the garden. And even though I have a what I'm calling a white garden, I do have some pops of purple or, you know, there's not much blue in the garden and for, you know, scientific reasons, plants don't form blue. Really make uh, blue, as yeah. Much, <laughs> but you can get the purple or a bluish purple because it actually makes the white look better. It makes it pop more. So purple and yellow and white is beautiful. I wouldn't do that inside. That's not my my vibe. I'm not a purple person, but I love purple in the garden. Let's go back to the inside for a while. So you've got a limited color palette. Pick three colors that you love that work well together. 
So I'm looking at your your book is behind you. It's green. There's a little bit of a, a, a like a soft pink in there, and then maybe you bring in a little a, a little variation. Maybe if you like blue or a little orange pop or something like that. And then I would use that color palette. And also you're going to work in a neutral throughout the home. So maybe in your living room you've got a green sofa, and then you're going to do little pops of your pop color in the toss pillows, and. And maybe your rug is sort of a pattern, but it's got those colors working into it. And then maybe another room, you're going to go a little heavier in one of the other colors, but you're going to see this repeated throughout the room, then throughout the home, which leads me to my next top 10 tip is creating the flow. So it's almost like connect the dots for your eyes. So with your limited color palette, it allows you to create this flow through an individual room or through your whole home or your whole main floor. And you can also apply this in the garden. You never want to go to the garden center and buy one of each plant that you love because then you're going to look like you have a garden center and not a garden. It's not going to look designed. So... I would limit the color palette in the garden, and then I would also create this flow with the palette and with repeating the plants. So you maybe only want to pick five different types of plants, depending on the size of your your garden, your plot, your garden bed, whatever. If you've got a huge space, obviously that number can increase because you'd have more acreage to put in the plants. But you don't want to have a zillion different types of plants and you don't want to have a zillion different types of plants in a whole bunch of different colors. So what about in the home? How are we creating the flow in the home? Obviously, I you kind of rocked my world with that color palette idea. So basically <laughs> you're choosing, you know, a couple colors, but then anchoring your whole, you know, living room, kitchen, dining room all of those public rooms in your house, but then you're just bringing out one color as a prominent color in each room, but it's cohesive because it's in that color palette. Right, right. So you can use them to differing degrees or percentages in the different rooms. Each room doesn't have to be set up exactly the same way or or don't do it in, you know, if you're doing three colors, don't do it in thirds, you know, mix it up a little bit. And then with flow, so inside, what are other ways that we can, I loved on your YouTube video, how you have pictures everywhere. Like what are other ways that you can create flow and cohesiveness across a home? Right. So besides the colors that you're choosing, if there's something that really resonates with you, I just have this thing with white ironstone pictures and I just love them. I can't stop myself from buying them. There's just something so beautiful. The lines are beautiful. They're also utilitarian. You know, you can grab it and use it, uh, you know, for a water pitcher, you can grab it and put a bouquet in it. I love them. And I think when you collect some, find something that you love and you collect it, if you display it on moss, it has a lot bigger input. So if you'll see on um, in my home, I have certain spots in my home where I'll have a collection of them together or across my, I have a metal and glass doors to the back of my kitchen leading out to the garden. And above it, I put a very narrow shelf. So it runs the whole expanse of like 10, 12 feet. And I have various sizes, little white pictures in order, in a sense, in size order up and then back down across there. So it really makes an impact. And then you'll see a white picture maybe uh, clustered with a couple of other ones in the dining room where I'll go to Trader Joe's and throw a bunch of flowers in there. So you'll see that element repeated over and over again. I love gilded frames. So whether or not they've got a mirror in them or a picture or some are even just empty, you'll see them repeat throughout my home. So what happens with your eye when you, you're doing this repetition is that it's almost like a connect the dots game. And it's very soothing to your eye. If anyone who's listening has ever gone to a showcase home where each room was totally different, like this is the jungle room. And then the right. bedroom is <laughs> all animal prints. And then, you know, we have the Lily Pulitzer banquette in the kitchen and it's all pink and green. And it's very well, it's fun, and maybe you're having a fun day looking around, but it's very disjointing. You know, you, you think, oh, I can appreciate that, but I wouldn't want to live here. So it's nice yeah. to live in a home where you've created this flow. It's interesting for my community, houseplants are probably one of those things that anchor all of the rooms. 
because most of us have plants across our whole space. Right. And I'm a big proponent of putting all of your plants in the same color planter or the same family of planter. I used to have all white and now I have all terracotta. And so that terracotta and that plant, even if they're different plants, different sizes, will kind of anchor you throughout your home, which is really cool. That's exactly what's going on. So that whether it's the terracotta or the white or whatever color uh, container you would pick with drainage, then you're going to have that. And you'll see that where, you know, it could be a completely different style plant, different size, different leaf shape, all of that. But that's going to be the unifying factor. And for people who are really into their plants and you're going to have a lot of plants, maybe you do the containers in your pop color. You know, So you bring in the limited color palette through the plants as well. Oh, I love that. And then it's making me think in the garden, for the garden design, creating flow. Like I love hummingbirds so me much. Too. I'm a hummingbird lady. Like I like sit and have dinner with the hummingbirds every night in the summer. So my thought is like, how can you have hummingbird feeders in different areas of the garden? Or I feel like we see a lot of stone accents or like mm-hmm. bird baths or stuff like that, like throughout the garden that kind of breaks the garden up, but also offers that repetition or like chairs or like, I'm thinking about not just plants in terms of having flow. Your hardscape, your outdoor furniture. I love garden stools. You can pop them around. They can be just decorative or you can use them as a side table. Just be careful because a lot of them are some reason a little domed on the top. Hard to put a wine glass on those. So you have to get a flat one. But this is how much I love hummingbirds, Maria, is in my all white garden because you know the hummingbirds are attracted to red. I do red several red hummingbird feeders because, you know, they love it and I love them. So they're there. So that's really the only little pop of red that I have going on in the back. But yeah, you can create the flow not only with your plants and outside your flowers or your flowering plants, but you can create it with the hardscape, as you mentioned, or the cushions or some toss pillows that you might put on a lounge chair or something like that. Or your walkway, like having the same type of walkway throughout a garden. Absolutely. And another thing to consider when you're thinking about your color palette and the flow in the garden is succession planting. Because unlike inside, where if you buy a lavender pillow, it's going to stay lavender and not change color or die. Outside, if you have some, let's just say some salvia or something like that, and you have some, something or a penstemon or something that's a beautiful deep purple, it's only going to bloom for so long. So if you want to keep the color going and keep that palette alive over a longer period of time, obviously, depending on where you are geographically and the type of weather you get, you want to think about some succession planting. Mm-hmm. So you want to say, oh, well, what blooms in my color in the spring, wherever I live. And then what will really take the heat of the summer, wherever I live, that's the same color. And maybe plant those as well. So you've always got something growing that's going to give you the color. I love that. Yeah. In my mom's garden, she has yellow in every season. So the spring would have the yellow tulips then the black eyed Susans would come and then the sunflowers and then the mums, you know, like But there was always pops of yellow coming up in the garden, which beautiful. Oh, I love that. Depending upon your palette or your flow or whatever, succession planting is a really great idea. Yeah, love it. If you are loving the topic of today's episode, you are going to love this new book by Ryan McKenney, Field Guide to Outside Style. If you ever wondered how the heck do I make my lawn or backyard look restorative, stylish, and cohesive instead of a hoarder's dream with overgrown plants everywhere that you can't figure out how to care for, the new book Field Guide to Outside Style by Ryan McKenney is the answer to your problem. Throughout the pages of Field Guide to Outside Style, you'll learn to personalize your outdoor living space with the right plants, furnishings, and other design elements to create a space that reflects you perfectly. Even if you don't understand color in garden design, Ryan walks you through everything with no intimidating language. He'll help you translate your choices in clothing, colors, furniture, and architecture and turn that into an understanding of how to design your outdoor areas. So he takes your personal style and helps you translate that to your outdoor area. Once you figure that out, he's going to help you decide which 
which of the three primary outdoor design styles, the classic, the modernist, and the naturalist, suit you best and use easy-to-digest, mix-and-match design suggestions and recipes to create an outdoor living area of your dreams. Did I mention there are a lot of options, case studies, and before and after pictures to help you really digest this concept? For me, I'm a visual learner. I need before and after pictures because design is a pain point for me. So grab a copy of the Field Guide to Outside Design and select plants and design concepts that work in your region, fit within your abilities, and ultimately match the rest of your life perfectly. You can find the Field Guide to Outside Design by Ryan McKenney at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's Field Guide to Outside Design by Ryan McKenney wherever books are sold. Field Guide to Outside Design. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. All right, next tip. You want to think about the rule of threes as it pertains to inside and to outside. There's something about the odd number that is very pleasing to the eye. Like the eye liking this flow where it's picking up these colors or these different elements over and over again. Odd numbers really work. So when we're talking about creating a vignette, which is just a little grouping of objects inside your home, we like to say inside they're great to be grouped on a tray because it just sort of grounds them. And maybe you have a candle or a vase or or a little picture or a little stack of books or something like that. So that's a vignette inside. You can be creating vignettes on all different scales, different sizes, and you can be doing them inside and outside. And so how I would apply the rule of threes to planting is I would always plant in odd numbers. So again, depending on the size of your garden or your balcony or your space, three, five, seven, you can keep going. But try not to ever buy just one unless it's a specimen tree. And don't do even numbers. This is something about it that is not as pleasing to the eye as the odd numbers. So work in the rule of three outside. If you're going to flank something, you know, maybe you do three little boxwoods on one side, three little boxwoods on the other side. Or if you're going to do a cluster of container gardens, you can try it. Just like it's just as easy as taking the photo. So do, take the photo for sure, but then you can actually drag over a couple of container gardens, put two together and see what you think. Then put three, then put four. Hundred percent, you're going to like the grouping of three better, mm. and it'd be great to vary the heights. Two of them can be maybe the same height, and then you have a smaller one, or you could have of differing heights, graduated heights. What about what about? I feel like two chairs in a garden is very common because you're having you know two chairs for like a conversation. How would you use the th- the rule of three with that? I'd put a little table in between or a little garden stool ah, in between. Ah, the table makes it three. Right. Okay, got because it. Because even if you have two little chairs, sure, you could go sit there. But if you're probably going to sit there with somebody, they're going to maybe want a, a coffee, a glass of wine, put a book down, something like that. So it's functional as well. Got it. Oh, I love that. Okay. Yeah, the rule of three, Betsy taught me about the rule of three, and that's how – uneducated I am when it comes to design. I had never heard of that before. And I was like, wow, this is a good, that's a good idea. Yeah. And it is just so easy to implement. Another thing that we talk about inside is layering. So I love layering rugs. I'll maybe have a a sizal and then I'll put maybe a colorful rug on top of it on an angle or a faux hide or something like that. It just adds 
texture, comfort, that little designer element that you wouldn't get with just one rug. Same thing with window treatments. Maybe you have some natural woven blinds or shades, and then you flank it with some drapery panels. And maybe you never intend to close them and open them, but they're just there for aesthetics. And they add a lot to the room. They're going to bring your eye up, give you some height in the room. So layering does a lot on the table. Instead of just having your table, put a runner on it. And on top of the runner, you know, put maybe a tureen with some beautiful plants in it or something. So layering on not only textiles, but other elements is great. And that works outside too. So if you have the ability to have a garden bed, make it a little deeper. So have it where you've got different heights of plants. You've got the tall ones in the back. Maybe you've got your mom's black-eyed Susans in the back, and then maybe you're putting something lower in the front, and then you're putting a little ground cover or a little annual color right in the front row. So you can see what's going on in the back, and it has this fullness to it. And you can also layer by underplanting things. So if you plop something simple, like a beautiful boxwood in the center of a mid to, to large size container with nothing around it. Sure, you can mulch it and it'll look nice and it has that very sort of clean, sharp green going on, but could even be more beautiful if you underplant it with some plants that will like the same amount of sun and the same amount of water. But the layering effect, it looks really luscious and it's just so inviting both inside and out. And I know this isn't an aesthetic thing, but even just like bulbs, like thinking about how you have bulbs that are waiting to come up as a mm-hmm. like literal la- like under layer of the soil that will yes. come up around the plants that are already there. That's really cool. Yeah, there is something about layering that just makes something look expensive or like really finished, isn't there? I- inside, for sure. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. It's like that you took that extra step that extra moment to to just really put the icing on the cake. And that's what I feel like happens with the layering, the rugs and things like that. People don't think about doing that. And then once you do it, it's so easy. I mean, obviously you have to buy another rug or whatnot. It really is going to go, it's going to give you a lot more bang for your buck in the look than you would expect. So good. Balance is something that people really struggle with, balance and scale. So everyone's home is different. Your ceiling heights are different. Your furniture is all different. So it's hard to give one tip that's going to apply to every space and every type of furnishing. But just think about the Titanic. (laughs) You don't want your room to be super heavy on one side. You have a big sofa that goes to the ground that has big rounded arms on one side. And on the other side, you have these two little wooden chairs. That's not going to be in balance. Or you have a giant TV entertainment unit. And then on the other side, you have a little coffee table with legs and maybe a small slipper chair. That's not going to balance out. So you want your rooms to balance and you want the items in the room, whether it's furniture or art or plants, to be in scale. I have a client who I absolutely love, and we've done such great work inside and outside. And I tell her, we got to get really big plants. And she said, oh, I love going to the nursery. I'll get the plants. And every time she comes back, she comes with this this size, and then maybe this size. And I'm talking this size, and I'm talking this size. Yeah, I want an eight-foot fiddly fig to balance out her room. So we keep trying, but... It has to be something that is going to work with what's going on. If you've got small house plants in smaller size pots, you don't want to put them on the ground or low down if your furniture is big or or if the room is big. It's going to look like you, you put them there and they're actually supposed to go somewhere else and you forgot to come pick them up and move them. They're just not going to look right. And then the same thing outside, because I like to think about my garden, my whole outside space. The same way I would think about it is inside space. So you want the balance to be going on there. Some people have outdoor kitchens and things like that. If you've got that going on on one side and then you've got nothing going on on the other side, maybe just some lawn or mulch area or something, maybe think about a specimen tree. Maybe think about putting some hedging in, thinking about go vertical. There are so many things that you can do vertically in the garden. And sometimes people don't think about going up. They think about just planting something, you know, in the ground and having it sort of be, you know, knee high or whatnot. 
So there's a lot of ways you can balance it out. The difference between balance and scale is balance more of like a horizontal and scale more of a like vertical bigger? Sort of. From a design perspective. Like yeah. How would you define those two or explain the difference? I would see, say balance maybe has to do with more of the entire space and how you're using the volume of space that you have in the room literally is everything on one side. It was all the furniture pushed up against one wall and there's nothing going on on the other side. So you want to be able to, when you looked around the room, to see similarly sized things and weighted things. And then scale is more about the individual pieces. How do they relate to the space? Do they feel too small? The ceiling is a cathedral ceiling and you have all low mid-century furniture. Maybe that doesn't feel so great. They'd feel better in a a room that has eight-foot ceilings. Or you have eight-foot ceilings and you have a gigantic media cabinet and it's, you're scraping the ceiling, that's going to feel overwhelming in the space. And then there's another element that kind of works with all of it is visual noise. So it sounds kind of like maybe pejorative, but it's not. It's just, what is the visual noise of something? How much attention is it grabbing? So say you had a sofa that was upholstered and it went to the ground and you had pillows on it and it was a very loud pattern then you're probably not going to want to couple it with a very busy coffee table or very busy accent chairs near it. Maybe your coffee table then becomes lucite or a very simple metal form. So that has more uh, lower visual noise because the sofa is taking a lot of attention. You just can't have a lot of competing focal points in the room. So that kind of works in with scale and balance too. It makes me think of a garden that I know of where there's an enormous boulder, like a huge rock, and the previous tenants had large plants that almost made the rock look smaller. Like it's an enorm taller than me, right? Like a huge rock surrounded by big plants, big perennials, lots of blooms. It's almost dwarfed towards the summer with everything. The new tenants took the big stuff out and have really small plants under, like around this boulder. And the scale is so off and it looks so weird. And so it's made the boulder look egregious. Like it's made the boulder be like, oh my God, that's a big rock right there. (laughs) That is a rock garden where before it didn't feel like that, you know? So it is, I think, in the garden too with scale. Like, do you have natural stone? Do you have a really big tree? that then you need to kind of counterbalance on the other side. Like you said with the, you know, outdoor kitchen or also with houses, like sometimes there's a porch that's only half of the house. You know what I mean? Like whatever you're working with needs to balance out. And I think also with houseplant parents indoors, because we put all of our plants near the windows. I know that in my old apartment in New York City, the balance was totally off because all of my plants were near my Southern facing windows. So then I didn't, You know, I had other things going on in the other side of my house, but that's also an interesting thing to think about with your plant collection and I guess your interior design, but with your plants to make sure that they're kind of appropriately placed. Yes. I think grouping them, like we talked about those white pictures that I'm obsessed with, when you group things together, they do have a bigger impact. So I would encourage grouping your indoor house plants. I love the idea of unifying them through the container style or color. That's a great idea. But then instead of putting, if possible, instead of putting every single one of them in front of one window, maybe you do a group of three here, a group of five here, a group of seven over there at a different window. And so you've got them going all around the interior, you know, if possible, if you're living in a one room apartment in Manhattan and you've got one window, then that's what you're going to be doing. But then maybe you balance the other side. So say you have a window in front of you, that's your only window behind you. It's a solid wall. Then maybe you put a big piece of art or you put a big mirror. Mirrors do an amazing job in a room. It's not just for checking yourself out. It's to bounce the light around. And I could see in a situation like that, where if you had all these beautiful house plants enjoying the sunshine in front of the window and opposite it, you put a very large mirror, it's going to not only bounce the light, but it's going to reflect that greenery 
That's a great idea. We didn't include this in your list of tips, but in one of your YouTube videos I was watching, you suggested to have mirrors throughout a space to reflect light, to kind of amplify a room. And you don't even need, like one of the mirrors that you used in an example had patina over it. Like you wouldn't right. even be able to see your reflection, but to just have bouncing the light around the room. It does wonders. Yeah, really cool. And I guess in the garden, that's water features, right? Like water is going to reflect light. And I'm a huge fan of a bird bath or a little pond or some sort of little running stream or something. All right, we've got more tips, right? Yes, we do. Okay, so we did balance, we did layers, we have the touch of black is something that is so critical inside. And people are like, oh, I don't like black, or that doesn't go with my palette, or you know, I'm not sure. But wow, we have gotten so many emails over the years where people tried it and they're like, I can't believe what a difference this made. And it can be very small. It can be a little side table like you were asking earlier about painting furniture. Maybe you find something at a yard sale or a thrift store or something, and it's got great bones, but you don't love the beat up brownness of it. Spray painted. I love matte black spray paint. I mean, seriously, like I went through a stage where if somebody was standing still, I was going to spray paint them. I was so <laughs> into it because it's magic in a can. So you could spray paint something you already have black, uh, but it does do something to a room. It just kind of is a little sophistication and it makes other things look better because they're juxtaposed with the black. Even if your palette has no black in it at all, trust me, a little black is going to not only do those two things, but it's also going to ground the space a little bit. Now, black in the garden is hard. Like there are black irises. There is a few black things here and there, but I, I did have the most darling little black pansies last year. But you're not going to find too many black plants, black mondo grass maybe, but that's super expensive. It doesn't have to be necessarily black, but try a unifying color that is very natural. So stones or pavers or your terracotta planters, something like that. You could maybe substitute that for the touch of black outside, but you could go with the black. You know, you could do some black wrought iron chairs. You could do a black garden stool. You could have a black umbrella. You could add it in that way out in the garden. Or trellising, you could have black trellises or like obelisks, you know? Yeah, so it could be like a form of black metal, something like that. I love what umbrellas do as far as protecting you from the sun. And we have a south-facing backyard. It is blazing hot here in Southern California in the sun in the summertime. So I have a lot of umbrellas that we pop up of various sizes. But I don't want to really see them, think of them. I just want them to function. So I have them in all black, which goes with the exterior of our home. But I think even if I didn't have that color paint on my home in the, as the accent color, I might have gone black anyway because they kind of go away. It's not like I have a striped umbrella and now I, and I have five of them and I'm seeing them everywhere. They just kind of go away. So I think black can be very useful in the landscape as well. And with black in the interior, because we were just talking about balance, you were mm -hmm. saying, can you just do one black thing in a room or do you need to take that balance into consideration with the black accents? No, you don't have to worry about trying to balance out the black because it's really just going to be a little touch. So, okay. I mean, it could be as simple as like we said, a little side table. It could be the metal legs on your coffee table. It could be a collection of three frames that are black. Really, it could be the smallest touch, but it will make a difference in the room. I love it. Another thing that we really like to focus on in the interior is not having any ugly storage. We all need storage. I live in a Victorian. I am storage deprived for sure. So I have to get really creative and I don't want to have plastic bins and I don't want to have plastic things in my kitchen if I can get away with it. So think about blending your storage with your decor. So in some of these white pictures that I keep talking about, one, I have uh, batteries in one. I have uh, my dishwasher pods in another one. Uh, I keep a, an extra phone charger and Apple Watch charger in another one. So I use the things that I'm using for decor as my storage as well. Baskets are great. Lidded baskets are terrific. And you can do this outside as well. You don't have to have ugly bins. You don't have to have a plastic shed, right? You can think of ways to incorporate beautiful 
focal points in your garden, and then they can also be used for storage as well. There are a lot of cute little sheds. Wayfair has really darling little sheds, those plastic ones. I love galvanized buckets. Uh, the ash can size ones, if you got the trash cans, they all come with lids, but the little ash can size ones are great. Uh, you can use them for storage. I have extra gardening gloves and some, I don't leave my good shovels outside, but I have some shovels that I just leave outside in case I need to grab them right away and they're in there. You can also use those type of containers for plants. You just drill some holes in the bottom of them. Um, I did something that was pretty interesting. Now, this isn't necessarily a storage thing, but it's using a somewhat of a storage item. The large galvanized trash cans, you know, that you can picture them, the silver ones, right? So I purchased those, went to town with my matte black spray paint, drilled holes in the bottom, and what I did was took my biggest cantilever umbrella because I hate those plastic bottoms that they come with. Mm, you know, sometimes yeah. you fill them with water or stones or something. Yep, like. It's just yep. very obtrusive. We have one. And ugly. So I put some cement in the bottom. <gasps> right? But I did make drainage holes and then I made holes through the cement. But the tube goes into the cement so the umbrella is secured. Then I filled it with dirt. Now, I'm only putting small plants. I have like some scented geraniums. I had some cyclamen when it was cold around it. So it's a planter. The umbrella is going nowhere. That is the coolest thing I've ever heard. And it was like 20 bucks for this giant planter what? and umbrella holder. Because those giant planters are so expensive. If you yes. were to go buy that at, I don't know, some garden center, that would be $200. Oh, easily. That is so smart. Oh, my gosh. 13 foot umbrella that cantilevers over. So it's heavy. So it, this holds it. I mean, you do have to put some, so, you know, substantial amount of cement in the bottom. And as I said, I did make drainage holes and poked holes through the cement. But what I ultimately had to do after a hard rain was just drill some holes around the side. So the excess water to come out. That would be an extra tip to anybody who wanted to try it. But a bunch of people have tried this after I told them about it and to great success. That is very cool. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> Talk about vision. That's incredible. <laughs> you know, as I said, I have the spray paint thing. I love galvanized things. And I thought, how can I make this work? And so then that's a unifying factor because around my garden, I have containers, but then I've, I'll pop one of these smaller black ones. Well, I've spray painted them black and like I have a lavender that's doing so well in there. I wouldn't, you can't put because it's metal, you know, you don't want to put a plant that's going to be very sensitive to the heat. So a heat lover is better suited for a metal container. And then a really good thing to think about inside and outside is leaving some room for negative space. That's hard (laughs) for house plant parents for sure. Yeah, agreed. It's hard for anyone because you see the empty space and you think, oh, I should put something there. And I've done it myself. I've over-decorated. We just did an episode not too long ago about over-decorating. I have definitely over-decorated where it looked like, is this a store? You know, or is this where people live? So you don't want to fall prey to that trap of just filling space. It's like, you know, when you're having a conversation, people are uncomfortable with silences, right? So la, 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 you try to fill it in. And I think that they try to do that at their, in their home and out in the garden too. And particularly out in the garden, you know, you can create this whole Zen thing going on. Like these people you talked about with the rock, if they didn't like the big plants, maybe just leave the rock. Wouldn't that be more Zen than you're saying those plants are too small to be next to that rock, right? And it kind of takes away from the rock. It's not enhancing it, right? So don't just add something. It has to be purposeful. It has, should have meaning. It obviously should have meaning to you if it's in your home. And if it's out in your garden, it's okay if you have an area that's just still have grass, a lot of people getting rid of their lawns or whatnot, where there's just a little green space or where you don't have to fill it with something. You can just have that little peaceful moment because then there will be other areas where there's a lot going on. So it'll give your eye an opportunity to rest. So it's not empty. It's actually negative space that's making a positive impact on the overall look. I love that. And I think probably the hardest tip for maximalists or for especially people like gardeners who want to get all the plants and have all the house plants. But I think it really does make an impact. And I'll say, you know, I had 160 house plants in 500 <gasps> square feet at the top of my heyday. Oh my gosh. 
And I have about 50 or 60 plants now. And the space that that reduction gave me, because I had to get rid of some plants when I moved to the country, it's nice. (laughs) I don't know. Because then also it lets me kind of focus on maybe art that I want to get that has plants on it. Like Mm -hmm. it, it helps me like look for other sources for my passion. Like I've started a collection of watering cans. Oh, I love it. I have a collection of watering cans too. Really? Yeah. I mean, you can never have enough, <laughs> really. Yeah, that's what but, I think. <laughs> um, I do think that space is, I feel like that tip you can apply to your life as well. Like just giving yourself space oh, in yeah, general, yeah. you know, negative space in your schedule, negative space in your mind, negative space. Self-care you know, as well. Totally. And yeah. self-care. Absolutely. And inside, what you can do is rotate. You can't really do that outside. You're not going to dig something up and move it around or wait for a plant to die or hope it dies so you can change it up a little bit. But inside, if you have too many things, not house plants, but other things, decor things, you can just rotate them. You don't have to make that ultimate decision. But if something isn't really something you love and it's just extra, Pass it along, you know, give it to Goodwill, give it to a friend. Somebody else might really love it. Do you know Stephanie from Sustainable Minimalists? No, I don't know her. She's another podcaster in our home and garden section. She came on the show and did an episode on minimalism and plants. And we had a big conversation about how do you approach reducing if you want to reduce your collection? Because right. I think it's it's painful. It can be painful. Oh, yeah, they're your babies. Yeah. But this conversation has been anything but painful. I (laughs) feel like I love this conversation so much because I feel like I really learned in 50 minutes, we just did double duty. Like I learned tips for interior and you really got me thinking about some garden stuff, especially think the balance and scale thing is something that you really need to take into consideration. I love the black as an anchor. I think that's really cool. And I'm really excited to to ast- apply these tips. Now, you have an incredible podcast with, like you said, a billion episodes all about interior design. You have a book. You have What Are Palettes? Where can everyone come and learn more about specifically interior design and how to have timeless homes? Where can everyone learn all the things from you? Okay, well, I am My Soulful Home, so they can go to mysoulfulhome.com. And from there, it's my site. You can read my blog posts, which are a gazillion of them there. Also, access the podcast. You can check out my book. You can check out my YouTube, obviously, link to my socials, my Instagram, and whatnot. So, I am My Soulful Home on all social media is because my co-host and I came to the podcast and we had both been blogging for a long time. So so that's really my separate identity. And then together we are decorating tips and tricks. So wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, any podcast player, you can find decorating tips and tricks. And you can go to de- decorating tips and tricks.com. You can access the podcast there as well. That's where we have all the show notes and we do design consults. We love doing design consults. So you can sign up for a consult with us there. I do garden design consults. So you can sign up for those through myselfahome.com. And I do them virtually. I mean, I recently had a client in Italy and that was fantastic. And yeah, so cool. Lots of fun. So cool. Well, and can you also send me some photos of your garden that we can put in the show notes so people can take a look? I definitely need to see that umbrella and I want to see (laughs) your all white garden. Yeah. um, Yeah. Any of your blogs that you have specifically about your garden as well, send. And we'll link everything in the show notes, including your book. This was so fun, and I hope to have you back again. This was a great chat. That'd be wonderful, Maria. Thank you so much. It's been great to get to know you. Thank you so much for taking the time. You too. Bye. All right, plant friends. I hope you enjoyed this unique episode for the Growing Joy podcast. I've now had a couple of different guest experts on that aren't planty experts. They're interior design experts. They're minimalism experts. Let me know if you like the style of interview where I'm talking with people with expertise in a different area, but bringing it back to plants. I personally find it really interesting and really fun, but I'm curious if you're enjoying it and if you have any ideas of other kind of verticals that you would want me to explore trying to find a guest for. 
Like I said, I've already applied two of the principles we talked about today to my interior design because I think I need more help with my interior design than with my garden design. But if you're interested in learning more about interior decorating, definitely check out the Decorating Tips and Tricks podcast. Of course, we're going to link to everything in the show notes so you can check out Kelly and all of the amazing blogs that she has to offer. I know as we're in the spring moment, a lot of us are spring cleaning. A lot of us are just kind of assessing what state our homes are in after a long winter. I hope this episode helps you assess and reframe whatever you need to, but also get excited for your garden, right? Because sometimes we can all get overwhelmed with seed starting and buying plants and seed catalogs and like the nitty gritty of getting the garden set up. But like take a minute and visualize what you want your garden to look like, what you want your houseplant collection to look like, what growth you want to experience this spring and summer. And take a minute to sit with that before you, you know, go take massive action. So I hope this episode was helpful. And until next week, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plan friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to up-level your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. 
But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free plant parent personality test because plant friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little plant parent personality quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 